Good morning. Welcome to Sunday at First Baptist Church here in Berlin. We are so glad you've joined us today. We're looking forward to a great time as we go to the Word of God and spend some time in worship and prayer together. This is an amazing season of Christmas, and we're looking forward to, of course, a celebration. This year may be a little different in many cases because of some of the restrictions that are in place, and maybe you're not able to be with your family and able to do the things that you would normally do. But I, I think that there's no question we can certainly still understand, remember what this season is all about, and maybe uh, maybe even in a greater way than we have as we really stop to think about what it's about. Now, many people and many churches are celebrating uh, during this month. We call it Advent season. If you're doing that, we will be talking about the candles in the Advent uh, in the Advent wreath. If you have one in your home, it's a great thing. You can be doing that as a family and be reminded of it. The Advent, the word Advent means arrival or coming, as we mentioned last week. And it's definitely a time that we can remember not just the fact that Jesus came as a baby in a manger, a very important part of the story, of course, but that's just part of it because he is, and not only has he come to, um, to this earth as a baby, he lived on this earth, uh, was crucified, and he rose again from the dead, but he's ascended to heaven, and one day he is coming again. So when we come to Advent season, as it is called in so many circles, that's one of the things we are definitely thinking about. Jesus is going to return someday, and we can really look forward to that just as you know, we think of the anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. He is coming again, and uh, it is definitely something we can be rejoicing about. Last week, we lit the candle representing hope, reminding us of the hope that we have in the promises of God. No matter how may dark the world might be, that light of hope still shines in our hearts because of the birth of our Savior. So this would be the week when we would, have, of course, uh, re, uh, light that candle as well, reminding us of hope. But this week we're reminded of God's love. And as we light the second candle in the Advent wreath, Jesus shows us God's perfect love. There's no question about that. The baby in the manger is indeed a tremendous picture of that. He is God's love in human form. The love of God is truly what Christmas is all about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. And so at this point, we can light that second candle. Let's have a word of prayer together as we begin our time in the Word of God today. Father, thank you for your amazing love, something we can never, uh, never possibly completely understand in this life, but it's just it's an amazing, amazing gift that you give to us. I ask you your blessings to be upon this time we spend in your word today. Meet the needs of everyone that's represented here listening to this message, I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> I found a very interesting story, uh, really connected to Christmas time. About three weeks before Christmas, a gentleman living in Germany named Wolfgang Dirks died while he was watching television. Now that's not terribly unusual, but the problem was he lived all by himself. And neighbors in his Berlin apartment there in Berlin, Germany, uh, in the complex, they really didn't notice the absence of this 43-year-old man. His rent was continued to be paid automatically because it came out of his bank accounts. Five years later, the money finally ran out. The landlord noticed a missing monthly payment, so he went to Dirk's apartment to find out why he wasn't paying his rent that month. And he found Dirk's remains still in front of the television. The TV guide on his lap was open to December the 3rd, five years before that date. 
therefore is a presumed uh, day of his death. Though the television set had burned out, the lights on Dirk's Christmas tree were still twinkling away. For someone to die in such isolation that his neighbors never noticed, how lonely he must have been when he was alive. Evidently, no one cared enough to check on him or even notice that he wasn't around any longer. What a tragedy to live a life without the love and the friendship of others. Now, the story I just told might seem a strange way to introduce a sermon about love, but I believe it shows us how important love really is in each of our lives and then how empty we are without it. We desperately need that. You see, God has created us to have relationships with others. He's created us to love and to be loved, but most importantly, He's created us to experience His love and to love with all and to love Him with all of our heart, our soul, and our strength. That's the way God has made us. That's the way we function best. And without that love in our lives, there's an emptiness. As someone has said, there's an emptiness within everyone. There's a void, a God-shaped void that can only be filled by knowing the Lord in a personal way. And as we enter the Christmas season, we can hear a lot of talk about love and compassion. And I suppose that there are times that people now are showing more love and compassion than they normally do during the year. Usually you hope that people being a little nicer to each other. Sometimes you wonder when you... Uh, come across uh, conflicts maybe out there shopping or whatever. But this is a time we generally think more about love and compassion. But the truth is, millions of people are probably more depressed and lonely this time of year than any other. That takes place every single year around Christmas time. But this year, because of many of the pressures, because of the, of the COVID outbreak and so on, uh, there is a much higher rate of, of suicide and, and depression than perhaps has ever been, or at least for a very long time. The truth is that people desperately need to hear about the love of the one who is the reason for the season. There's, there's never been a time that that love is not in greater need. And if you know him, if you know and if you've experienced that love, we ought to be able to use this time of year as an opportunity to share that love with others. As I read a verse a moment ago, let me read this again. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we may have eternal life through him. This is real loved love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. As we talk about this, I think it's important we begin really uh, to define what true love really is. The reason I'm saying that is because we live in a culture that is totally confused about the definition of love. You hear people talk about different things. They'll they'll talk about falling in love and falling out of love. And um, they equate, I'm afraid, most people are equating love only as an emotion. And when people talk about falling in love and falling out of love, it's like they have no control. I mean, it's just something that comes over them. They can't explain it in that sense. And so they're, uh, they're given into these different whims that they face in their life. People, uh, and we find that marriages are, are dissolved because one or both parties have decided that they have fallen out of love of the one to whom they had committed themselves to. Or maybe they've fallen in love with somebody else. And all the time they feel like they're powerless to stop the whole process. That's just such a misconception about love really uh, that we find in, among, um, in our society today. But as you look at the scriptures, you'll find there's a complete different view of the subject. And this applies to, and today's message is, is not on the home and not on marriages specifically, but this definitely applies to the love between husbands and wives, between uh, parents and children, be- just all of us, the love that we can have and that we can know. If you want to know about real love, let will just go that direction. Look how God models his love for us. 
want to really understand what love is, if you're struggling in this area, you want to find out what love is, then look at how God shows us His love. John 3, 16. We started that verse a moment ago. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. And notice this. Let's just pick this apart a little bit. God's love is unconditional. He doesn't love us because we deserve His love. God did not love us because there's any reason that we were lovable because, to be honest, we are not in our, in our natural state. God's love is not based on, on, on the fact that we deserve it or that we have done something to earn it. And I'm afraid that's what many people look at and, and they're really approaching God in that way. And um, they feel like they never can please God because they know that they struggle in their life and that God must not really be very happy with them or that God's punishing them because of something that they've done. They don't understand what the love of God really is. God just loves us. He doesn't have to tell us even why. God just loves us and He loves us so much that He sent His Son to die for our sins. That's the very first thing that we need to understand. This is an unconditional love. And when we begin to understand unconditional love, we can have that uh, for other people around us as well uh, to a certain extent. This is the point that we're learning what true love is. And here's something else about God's love. God so loved the world that He gave. So God's love always results in action. God showed how much He loved. He didn't just say, I love you, I love you, this earth, I love the mankind, and then sat back and watch us go through all of our struggles. He loved us and He acted upon that and He sent His one and only Son into the world. The word that's used to describe God's love for us and the love we ought to have for others is, comes from the Greek word agapeo. Agape love describes a love that is determined by the will. There are several words for love in the Greek language, but this word specifically is talking about a love that you make a decision to act upon. Therefore, loving others is determined by the will, by decision to love. We choose to love, not by circumstances, not because we just feel about it, we feel like that, or because of what someone deserves. This type of love that we're talking about is a love that we decide that we choose to do. And that's what God and how God shows His love for us. With that in mind, I want you to think about this for a moment, how the love of God, the love that God has for us, how it is so far beyond our comprehension. The lyrics of God's, or the theme of God's love, has dominated the lyrics of hymns uh, probably since believers first started putting words together to, and sang them together in church. I know it has, if you go through the, um, the history of hymns, you'll find so many of them are focusing on that amazing love that God has for us. These amazing expressions of God's love for us have, uh, have at least this one characteristic in common, and that they, they express the impossibility of us totally understanding God's love. That's one thing they have basically in agreement. Perhaps one of the most popular songs of least in recent times is a song entitled The Love of God. It's written by a man named Frederick Lehman in 1917. Let me give you the lyrics, at least part of the lyrics of that song. You understand what I'm talking about. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave His Son to win. His erring child He reconciled and pardoned from His sin. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Now listen to this next verse. This is an amazing, just a tremendous expression of really coming in and looking to the love of God and saying, you know what, this is so far beyond what we deserve and what we could even totally comprehend. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. 
That's amazing, amazing love of God. Some years before that, a man named Charles Wesley in 1738 wrote this hymn entitled, And Can It Be? I love this old hymn. Listen to the words. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Charles Wesley, along with so many other of the saints of God, crying out and, and really in song expressing that to God, Lord, I don't understand why you love me, but I'm so glad that you do. This is a relatively new hymn written in 1995. How deep the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one brings many sons to glory. And then a very recent song written really just in 2017. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. We go on and on. There's so many of these songs, but I just wanted to show you how the heart of man cries out and really... Uh, Understanding that we can't understand really this vastness of God's love. And the, and the more we, and the closer we draw to God, the more overwhelming that love is to us to realize that He loves us. He loves me. In spite of myself, He loves me. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 19, Paul writes to the Ephesians and tells them this. He says, May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God, that amazing love. And while we're never going to totally and fully comprehend God's love, we must never lose the wonder that God should love a sinner such as I. It's just an amazing thing. And when we're down and when we're discouraged, let's be reminded of how much God loves us. Love is such an important part of the Christmas story. Not just because God sent His Son as a baby born in a manger, but because He sent Him then to die for us. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 8, speaking of this, says, and referencing Jesus, and being found in human form, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. When we dwell on God's love for us, it is life-changing. It really is. It will change the way we look at everything else in our lives. We may be going through some really tough times. We may be struggling, whether it's physically, or maybe we're going through some problems and some relationship issues. Maybe we're truly discouraged and, and depressed and really struggling in these areas. But when we really begin to focus on the love of God, there's an amazing thing that takes place in our lives. Oh, thank God for His amazing love for us. Then I notice this, that the love of God doesn't just lift us up and, and encourage us individually. But when, going beyond that, the love of God will compel us to love others. A few years ago, we had a... Uh, a pastor that came to our church and, and brought us a special a series of messages. Um, his son is Jer Jeremy Courtney. Jeremy had moved his family to northern Iraq, and when uh, his father was with us in the services uh, several years ago, uh, Jeremy had just arrived or was just arriving there on the field. He wanted to minister to the people, and he was, first of all was in Turkey, then he moved into Iraq. While he was trying to build relationships with the Iraqis and tell them about Jesus, he discovered that hundreds of children in Iraq were dying because of heart defects. There were serious heart defects, but in most parts of the world they could be treated. But they were being left untreated because the Iraqi hospitals at that point were in shambles. He was able to put together a coalition of doctors and, and donors who transported many of these children to other countries for treatment. 
So they were reaching out and finding these children who were, were dying because they needed treatment, finding places they could send them to and they were being healed, they were being uh, able to live and so on. Lives are being saved, but it wasn't too long before he was placed on a hit list because some of the children had been sent to Israeli hospitals, didn't go very well with many of the people there in Iraq. Now, although there were threats on his life, Jeremy remained in the country, continued to try to help treating some many very, very sick children. He started what he calls today Preemptive Love Coalition. And through that, he was able to, with the help of many others, to bring doctors and the equipment back into Iraq so that the children could be treated in country. Now, let me ask you this. What would motivate a man to risk his life and even his family's welfare for others? What would cause him to have that type of concern for others? It's called the love of God. That's what, it's an amazing thing that takes place. Not only does it affect us when we begin to, and the more we begin to grasp the love that God has for us, but it makes a difference on the way we look at others. The scripture says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. We know, according to 1 John 3, 16, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Although the church in Ephesus, in fact, we just read a verse that had, was directed towards them just a moment ago. It had a wonderful history, and we've been talking about this in our Wednesday night Bible studies. Jesus actually addressed the church in the book of Revelation in chapter 2. They had a wonderful history of pastors. Can you imagine having the founding pastor of your church as the Apostle Paul? And that was their founding pastor. A young man named Timothy would take the reins then. And there's two books in the Bible written to him. Just some amazing leaders in that church. The Apostle John himself led that church for a couple de decades. These were, these were uh, people in a church that were, had some very sound teaching. The church was doctrinally sound, but Jesus addresses it in Revelation chapter 2 and warns the church that it's in danger of losing its place, losing its candlestick, as the expression used, which meant it would lose its influence as a church and maybe even cease to exist of a church because it had left its first love. You see how important that love of Christ showing through us is? So vital in our lives as believers. We're, we're giving an entirely wrong picture to a lost and dying world when we don't show the love of Christ in the way we live and the way we interact with others. When we're no longer moved by our love for God. Now, remember the, that force that causes us to respond in that way is God's love for us. This, that love never changes. But our response ought to be a love for Him. And when we're no longer moved by our love for God or each other and those even without Christ, we're on very, very dangerous ground. So the love of Christ and the love we're talking about as we come to this time of year and what God has done for us, it ought to motivate us to live our lives in a way that the love of God is showing through. And here's something that's very important for us to grasp. The love of God does not conflict with His judgment of sin. A scripture in 2 Peter chapter 3 verses number 9 to 10 tells us this. There are many, according to this passage, and if you read up a little bit further on uh, in that chapter, who were uh, questioning, they were really mocking the promise of the return of Christ because um, they had heard of its message for many, many years and he had not come. I hear people say things like that today. Well, my grandfather talked about the fact that Christ is coming back someday. He hasn't come back yet. must not be going to happen. Well, 
Here's what the, the response that Peter makes to that. He says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness. He's, uh, he hasn't forgotten what He promised. He's going to keep His promises. But His long-suffering toward us. Here's the reason that He's given, giving uh, as far as why the, the return of Christ has not taken place at this very moment. And he's referencing the people there. He says, but this, our, our God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Every moment that the return of Christ is delayed in that sense, there's another opportunity for someone to turn from their sin. The scripture then goes on in verse 10, says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Here's a very important truth. God is patient. He's long-suffering. There is no greater love than the love that God has for us. And yet there comes a day that the opportunities to turn from sin, to trust in what Christ has done for us, there comes a day those opportunities will be gone. The Lord is long-suffering, there's no question. He did evidence a greater love than we could comprehend when He sent His Son to this world to die in our place. There is no greater love than that. For the believer, that means that we will never have to face the wrath of God. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verse number 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. If you have put your faith in Christ, there's no condemnation. What a blessed thought to hold on to. We're not free from condemnation because we've lived good enough to deserve that. We're not free from condemnation because we are somehow righteous in ourselves because the Bible says there is none righteous. We're not free from condemnation because we've been religious enough. We've gone to church enough. We've put in enough in the offering plate. That's not why we're not under condemnation. The only claim to no condemnation is faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross. That baby that we're thinking of that was born in the manger, the beautiful story of Bethlehem, is really just a very small part of the story. It isn't the beginning and it's not the ending. You see, that baby grew up and we know him as the Savior who died for our sins, died a cruel death on the cross. They put him in a borrowed tomb, but the tomb couldn't hold him. Three days later, he was resurrected and he lives forever. That is the blessed story. That's because of the love that God has for us. His amazing love. But you must receive that gift that God offers you today. There's a popular movement which teaches today that because God is a God of love, He's never going to cast anyone into hell. That everyone, it's called universalism, everyone is going to go to heaven. Now that notion goes completely against the Scripture. It's important to understand this, that God's love does not cancel out His justice. Sin requires a payment. Sin requires atonement. Jesus provided that payment or that atonement for our sin when He died on the cross. But it only applies to those who put their faith in what Christ did on the cross. It's not universalism. It's not to everyone who lives on this earth. It's only to those who put their faith and trust in Christ. And the sad truth is that most people will reject the provision of the cross. And once they do that, there's no other remedy for man's sin. The first time Christ came to this earth, it was as a baby in a lowly manger to die for the sins of the world. 
The second time he comes, it will be as a conquering king of kings and lord of lords to execute judgment on all who have spurned him. Never forget that. The writer of Hebrews says this, but we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. That's why he came. But then the writer of Hebrews makes this statement in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? There is no other way. There's no other plan. There's one way to God, and that is through Christ. Jesus is indeed the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. That's the love of God that's shown to us. That's the love we can experience. And if you're a child of God, that's exactly what you have experienced in your life. You can have a hope because of the love that God has shown towards you. That blessed hope. When you're discouraged, when you're facing the hardest things you could ever imagine in this life, you can still experience the love of God because of what God has done for you, because of what Jesus did on the cross. And so we come to Christmas time, I think as believers, we ought to be reminded continually of this amazing love that God has towards us. And we ought to live a life showing that love to others. Being aware of the fact that they need to hear the gospel message. And in love and compassion, reaching out and letting people see the love of God in our lives. So that's a, that's a message on the love that we can have and how we can apply that to our lives. That if you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, I can tell you that God so loved you that he sent his son to die for you. And Jesus suffered the anguish of Calvary to pay for your sins. But you must receive what he has done for you. You do that by simple faith, believing that you're a sinner that needs a Savior and that Jesus is that Savior. If you never made that decision, let me tell you, it's the most important decision you ever make in your life. You might, you might be thinking about it. You might be contemplating what you're going to do that God has offered you. But let me, let me warn you of something. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. Do not neglect the salvation that God offers to you today. The most tragic thing that you could ever do. If you have questions about how you can really know and have peace in your life that you're a child of God, please feel free to contact us. We'd be so glad to talk with you about that. You can leave that in the comments section there in Facebook or go to our church website, which is berlinfbc.com. We'll be glad to communicate with you. We're so happy you've joined us today. Looking forward to an amazing time together as we continue on in our Hope for the Holidays series, talking about these amazing facets of God's grace and His goodness, His love, His joy, the peace that we can endure, all those things that God gives us as His children. So once again, we thank you for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next week. We invite you to uh, be part of our Bible study on Wednesday night uh, as we're going through the book of Revelation. Have a great week and keep your eyes on the one who loved you so much that he sent his son for you.